Okay, hello everybody. I'm taking pictures by accident. Like I'm on now. We're live. We're live. This will go up in a little while. Um, let's see now. This will be the first video. This is my daughter Bethany, and it's been a while since I uh, taught. I make sure to listen uh, with Bethany because I normally like rush things, and so I was kind of ready to like rush it before she got here. I said I'll meet you at the house. Um, uh, real quick update, and then we'll do a little of the teaching from the ma uh, the mass verses for today's date, September, what, March, March 3rd, 3rd 2019. 2019, okay? And I do like to add the date when I speak as well as when I'm making the date on the post simply because some of these videos, you might see them on one of these sites, my sites, and you might not see the text posts, okay? Because some of the sites are just link sharing sites and what you can always do is simply reference the date for the Catholic Mass verses that were for the date and that's why it's helpful all right um, a few quick updates in the book I'll try to teach uh, let me see I wrote a few notes um, the new site called VK I stumbled across it this past week and uh, it's the Facebook of Russia. I have seen the sharing link for that site on my multiple sites. And what I tried to do over time is uh, I have sharing links on Google and YouTube and you share, you share, you share. And I try to find some that are common, meaning whatever I can find on the YouTube and the Google Drive and uh, the three or four others, if it's common, okay, I'll try to start that thing. Trello, Mix, Reddit, all these. And I didn't realize it's an entire Facebook, Russian Facebook site. Like a whole site. So I post to it, and then I uploaded a bunch of videos. And also, it doesn't have a limit. So I realized, oh, this is like a whole uh, new thing. Um, so for that site, I just posted some of my I just picked a bunch of my past teachings, Western intellectual tradition, or things that I felt that were, you know, teachings before I got into a lot of my other news updates and all. And then, like, I looked at it the next day, and they have, like, 700 views, 800 views. And I'm very happy when that happens, but that also shows me how manipulative some of the other things are, because... You could be, and I do all these different sites, and then I'll look on BitChute. Oh, how do I have 200 views on this one thing I put up? Flickr, which happens to be down right now because they were purchased by another tech group called SmugMug. Okay. And I look at those little videos, like the uh, 200 something views, and then I look at YouTube, okay? So I see the whole little game that's played in. in this world of that you hear me speak on of media so I wanted to make the note today this video you can see it on YouTube later you see it on Facebook later and OneDrive okay my OneDrive link you can download it today if you want it all right so I'm gonna have that as the three that will go on and uh, let's see any other update uh, also because of all the websites that you see the new one I just mentioned, all the other ones you see. The main site, it's not the best site. It just became the main site for functionality. I got used to using that as the main one. Corpus Christi Outreach Ministries is a blog by blogger. Okay. Everybody on Facebook, you'll notice, if you ever try to clink, click a link to blogger, which is Google, which is very safe and very secure. Any blogger link that you see on Facebook, Facebook redirects you and says, this site is unsafe, whether it's me, whether it's anybody. Is blogger unsafe? Blogger is one of the safest websites you can go to because it's owned by Google, also now by YouTube. Why does Facebook do that? Because Blogger is a competitor to Facebook. YouTube is a competitor to Facebook. I have clicked a blogger link to other 
blogs that have their links on Facebook it says the same thing so it's just deception alright I want to mention that because some of you maybe you've seen all my little links that I have and you might go to the other ones but blogger would be the main one the other ones are all good but like if something comes up and it's like an update uh, you might not see that on Facebook alright as I will post that to the blog so the, just a few notes for my new friends and let's start doing a little teaching um, a few things that happened with my homeless friends this last week uh, they might it might fit into some of the verses Bethany what did Church Unlimited I didn't even make it to Church Unlimited I was gonna go but then I would have not been able to come here what did uh, Pastor Bill did he preach live today yes and it was okay. oh, last night it was the lies we believe. Oh, you went last night, that's mm -hmm. right, to the mm -hmm. service and you helped. Uh, what verses, though, do, uh, did he use? John 3.16. Okay. You know, it's like, to combat the lies, you got to, you know, focus on the truth. And, and a For lot God of so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Uh, now, this passage, though I was debating to talk about images of Scripture, uh, but it would actually be a good passage that you could teach it from. Before I, because I'm so impatient, when I got here in the car, I had to sit in the car for like 10 minutes. I'm looking on YouTube, and there get, there's a whole conspiracy thing going on. And they're debunking another guy that's a conspiracy and all. As I was watching some of that, there was a, an intelligent man I never heard of before. I won't give his name. But he came on, and he was talking about images, historical images. And I was thinking of mentioning that because one of the verses that will come up today will be I will exalt your horn like the horn of a unicorn and I will anoint you with fresh oil okay now that's going to be from the mass reading just was from Psalms 92 and uh, in that psalm which is today's mass reading there are a few scriptures just so happens that I quote out of that um, I will triumph through the work you have made me glad through your work Okay, singular. And I will triumph through the works of thy hands. That one is a regular quote one for me. Now, if my son-in-law shows up, they're getting furniture, and I told my daughter I'm going to start the video now. They bought, look at this big, they bought that huge <laughs> widescreen yeah, TV. Come, come steal from us. And, they, <laughs> and they're getting more furniture. Okay, that scripture from Psalms 92. I will, uh, you have made me glad through your work, and I will triumph through the works of thy hands. Also, Psalms 92 has uh, the horn of the unicorn. And just I didn't want to do too much on the unicorn. But what I was going to do as a joke, say, look, the Bible and science fit. And if it says unicorn, there's unicorn. But I also was going to talk a little bit about the language. Uh, there's a term we use for... Uh, parabolic language or language that uh, if you were to if I were to just ask you because I do a lot about science apologetics and how science and Christianity and God n never have contradicted it's the presuppositions that people have had that inform everything that they are involved in in life and if I were to ask a person, because some use this, that's King James language. I will exalt your horn like the horn of unicorn. If I were to ask a scientist and, and say, uh, what's a unicorn? Anybody would have a description of that mythological creature. Though it's not real. If you were, meaning unicorns don't exist. But if I were to ask a scientist, or if he bought a unicorn for his daughter, or, you know, a little toy, you, you understand what the image is. And I'll give you what that image might be in Scripture. Uh, there are verses that talk about John the Baptist. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. This is Scripture about Abraham. Look to the father that I called you uh, from, Israel, talking about God's people. I called him alone. See, God said unto Abraham, Get out of your country, from your kindred, and from your father's house, 
unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of you a great nation. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And through your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. The very famous story of Abraham the patriarch. Okay, now, the voice of one, the calling of one. In scripture, at times, there's a, a particular calling on that one. As well as we have calling as a community, but also the calling of one. And in scripture, horns denote authority, okay? That's what horns speak about. There's a famous prophecy in uh, the book of the prophet Zechariah, and God's going to raise up these four uh, craftsmen, these four people that are going to come against the horns of wickedness, okay? So now you have horns in scripture and the book of Revelation as well. So what would, I'll exalt your horn, I will give you authority, singular authority, I'll call you. You have authority in the kingdom of God, okay? So all of that would fit, and it wouldn't be something that you like. So that type of imagery uh, is fine in Scripture. And let me do Psalms 92. I'm, I'm in Psalms 92. The other one, they that be planted in the house of the Lord are going to flourish in the courts of our God. I like that one. And what was the other one from Psalms? Let me finish Psalms 92. Uh, every night I'll praise you. Uh, plant. Okay, I think I got those four. The other verses, the other note I want to make before I forget. Um, this might be a repost. When you see it, meaning I won't add all these verses, okay? So it makes it a little easier on me. Uh, some Sunday posts, like the one you saw today on the text websites, the text posts I did, I added the most recent video, which was a week ago, along with the previous teaching I did, all right? So I'm not sure if this will be a whole new one, so I might not add all of these verses, but if it's a new one, I'll add all of these verses. Let me get to the next one. Let's finish the mass verses real quick. 1 Corinthians 15, verse uh, 54 through 58. And you can go like a few verses back. But it's about the uh, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Now it's talking about the resurrection of the body and Paul's defense in that chapter, long chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, about the physical re resurrection. Now, the v previous verses I didn't do them last week, but it would be worth looking at because Paul talks about Adam and Jesus Christ, and he does that also in the letter to the Romans. And in Paul's teaching about uh, Jesus and Adam, the first man, Adam, and then the last Adam, which is Jesus, in Romans, how from the disobedience of one man, the account of Adam and Eve in the, God, in the book of Genesis, through the disobedience of one man, many would main sinners. That's not this chapter, that's in Romans. So by the obedience of one man shall many be made righteous. So now Paul took the account of Genesis, by the way, we're talking about, he took it as a historical account, the creation of man. And it was the disobedience of one man, Adam, God told them in the garden, you can eat of all the trees, but you're not going to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For the day that you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. And we know the story. The disobedience occurred, they sinned. Okay. And that's called original sin. Once again, Paul teaches that in the letter to the Romans. So now Paul says, because of that act recorded in the book of Genesis, the book of the beginnings, what was God also showing us? The disobedience of one man, that, that original sin, many were made sinners. And in the history of Christianity, the development of Christian doctrine, that's been a debate early on. In the, if, I don't do, if I don't write my own notes, and do, I can talk more. But early on in the Christian church, there were some famous Christian figures in uh, uh, third, fourth, fifth century, we read about debates between uh, a man by the name of Pelagius, and he was a Christian man, a Catholic leader, but he started teaching that original. He rejected the idea of original sin, which is indeed taught in Scripture, and he basically said, "No, people in and of themselves have the ability, if you will, to keep God's law." and to save themselves. 
and he was becoming very popular, and it's referred to as Pelagianism, okay? And that's a man by the name of Pelagius. Well, St. Augustine, the very influential early church father, had a great disagreement and combated that belief system that denied original sin. And so Augustine said, no, original sin is true. Paul also, like I said, taught it and led to the Romans. I just quoted it. By the disobedience of one man, Adam's transgression, many were made sinners, but so by the obedience of one man, many are made righteous. Now that obedience is the obedience of Christ's death on the cross, all right? Christian thinkers uh, also debated that. Did it mean that because Jesus never sinned, which he certainly never sinned, and was his act of obedience each and every day, was that what would redeem men? Because I just gave you another quote, by the obedience of Jesus Christ, many will be made righteous. It was the obedience to the death of the cross, okay? The simple obedience, which would be another reading for today, which comes out of Philippians chapter 2, okay? Christ was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And this is a debate in the Reformed thinkers and the Catholic thinkers and the scholars, because uh, without going too far, but for those who like going far into that, my Reformed friends, Reformed theology and scholars, many great thinkers like R.C. Sproul and others, uh, they will say that the righteousness of Christ is imputed unto us when we believe, going back to Genesis and going back to Abraham. God took Abraham and said, the key text on this would be Genesis 12 and 15. And the Lord took Abraham outside and said, uh, your offspring will be as many as the stars in heaven and the sand by the seashore. And it says, Abraham believed in the Lord and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Meaning Abraham believed the promise. God took him outside, said, look at those stars. Abraham also was told, leave your country, uh, the one I just quoted. Now, in the scripture, in Genesis, it says, when Abraham believed in the Lord, God counted that to him for righteousness. God imputed righteousness. Paul will use that in his letter to the Romans and Galatians, telling his Jewish brothers, see, we're not saved by the law, we're saved by faith, using that example, which is certainly a true example. And uh, go to Romans uh, 3 and 4 and Galatians uh, 3 and 4 as well would cover this. All right. What the righteousness of Christ, we, the scripture says we are made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. But it was the obedience of the death of the cross. That's the key, all right? Through the obedience of one man, many were uh, made righteous. All right, now 1 Corinthians 15, the chapter we're actually in, the previous verses talk about that. The last part, the one for the reading for today, would be on the resurrection of the body. And Paul will say, because there's a real resurrection, because there's a, Paul will say also in Corinthians, I think it's in that chapter, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Now that's what Paul said. If in this Christ, uh, life only, we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable, okay? So he, what he was telling them was, there's a future judgment to come and a future resurrection. And we know from New Testament, from Jesus himself, a resurrection of the just and of the unjust. And so what Paul does is interesting. At the end of that chapter, chapter 15, he says, because there's a resurrection and because we're going to come back, the, the corruptible is talking about the present body that we're in. This corruptible, it cannot inherit the kingdom. So the ultimate fulfillment of the kingdom comes along with the resurrection body, just like the body that Jesus rose from the dead from. Therefore, that encourages you to know that your labor is not in vain. You're not doing all this for nothing. There's an accounting to come. And we're going to give an account. Scripture says, Paul says, every man's going to give an account of the things that were done in his body. So what we understand from that verse from the Mass is there's going to be a transformation and a resurrection.
okay? A physical resurrection from the dead, all right? Let me go to the next. We could do more than that, but the next one, actually, the reading, I already quoted from it, but it would come from Philippians chapter 2. It was only uh, two verses, verse 15 and 16, among whom we shine as lights in the world. But let me get, go a little bit before that. Um, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself unto death, even the death of the cross. All right? So we say, we call that the kenosis, K-N-E-O-S-I-S, -S, when you study kind of little scholarly stuff, and it just meant the willingness of Jesus to empty himself. He, though being deity in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. That's King James. It means he did not see his deity as something to use to his own advantage, okay? Being in the form of God, though not robbery to be equal with God. But he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death of the cross. Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. Uh, things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. At that, the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So it was his willing obedience. Now, I mentioned earlier in the John chapter 3 verse, the famous one that Bethany said Pastor Bill spoke on. Most of us are familiar with it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the few verses right before it is the very interesting story that Jesus himself brings up in the discussion with Nicodemus. The John chapter 3 passage, uh, it's not in the reading. I'm, oh, I hope I get to Luke 6. That's part of the reading. But let me do the John 3. And if I go too long, I'm not going to write all the notes. This will just you watch the video. Um, G, uh, Nicodemus was a teacher, a Pharisee, and an educated man. And in John 3, G, uh, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night because the other religious teachers and Pharisees in the circles that Nicodemus ran in, they were all against, okay? It's very easy, whether it's a political figure, whether it's a religious figure, whether it's, uh, it's very easy to begin to form this group, whatever side of group it is, by the way. So at that stage in the ministry of Jesus, the Pharisees were dead set against it. This Jesus is not of God. He's casting, out demon, he's casting out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. All of these things, no matter what he did, Jesus would tell them, all these good works I have done, which one are you trying to kill me for? We're not trying to kill you for any of the works you did, they said, but because you make yourself equal to God. Over and over and over and over, they had these accusations against Jesus, all right? And at that point in the history of the whole group of Pharisees, the intellectuals, if you will, the religious leaders, they were rejecting. Stay away from him. Don't listen to him. They were mad. So this man Nicodemus is part of that group, the Pharisees. And he really has some questions. He sees the miracles. He knows the Old Testament prophets. And he's beginning to think, this is the Messiah. But you're not going to go openly and say, I'm on his side. Oh, are you one of Because that's what they would do. Are you one of them now? Because that's the accusations they would bring against any of the, the Pharisees that were starting to believe. So he comes by night, and he has this little conversation with Jesus. And Jesus responds to Nicodemus. Nicodemus says, we know your man come from God, because no man can do these miracles that thou do, except God be with him. And what's the response? Not a big, okay, Nicodemus, you're, cl you're getting close. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Right away, now he's saying, you must be born again. And this is confusing to this religious leader by the name of Nicodemus. How can a man be born when he's young, can, old? Can he enter the second time? Does his mother's woman be born? Nicodemus, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born is spirit is spirit. If you go to 1 Corinthians 15 again, if you go to the other verses previous, which would have been last 
week's mass reading. I like this a little better because it delves a little bit more. The first man is of the earth, earthly, the second man is the Lord from heaven. And that's the previous reading of 1 Corinthians 15. Now back to John 3. He says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. And that's why he's telling Nicodemus it's a new birth. Now what example is he going to be, give to Nicodemus from the Old Testament, which Nicodemus knew because he was a Pharisee, and that was part of his teaching. He had to know the Old Testament. He goes to something that happened at the time of Moses. And, it, and Jesus will tell Nicodemus, but he doesn't have to recount the whole story because Nicodemus knows. And he says to Moses this, as Moses lifted up, uh, he says Nicodemus says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Then you have the famous John 3.16. Okay, as Moses lifted up the serpent, that's a snake, in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now later, a few chapters later, Jesus talks again about the manner of death that he's, he's prophesied that his death is a, going to be a crucifixion. There's a few chapters over, you're going to read where Jesus said, except the Son of Man be lifted up. But when he's lifted up, he will draw all men unto him. And later on, if uh, the chapter's down in John's Gospel, John himself will say this was the prophecy of his own manner of death. When later he's brought before Pilate, uh, John, I don't know, chapter 18 or something, uh, Jesus himself will say before Pilate, they're delivering him to Pilate so the scripture would be fulfilled that he was going to be crucified. The manner of death was lifting up. He understood it was a crucifixion, which is a very shameful death. It was a common way that Romans executed people, but it was a shameful death. All right, so now, all the way back to the story of Moses and the snake. At one time, Moses, the, uh, the leader of God's people, a type and an image and symbol of Christ, and in many, many ways I can't do more right now. But the people were rebellious, the Jewish people. We understand that from reading the history. And one of the many times they were judged by God, one was, it, the King James says, fiery serpents bit the people, snakes. Okay, now I ride the quads with my son-in-law out here, and but sometimes we came across a snake the other day. I, we were walking, me and my daughter, son-in-law, there was a little snake. Okay, one of the judgments that God gave on the people for their sin was snakes were biting them, okay? Now, when the people were being bit by these venomous, poisonous snakes, they didn't know what to do. They looked to Moses, and what did God tell Moses to do? This is in the Old Testament. He said, make this bronze or brass snake, meaning he was going to make a, a, sort of an image. They knew how to do that because their history was they made some idols also at a wrong time, the bulls and all. But he said, make a snake, put it on a stick, Moses, hold that stick, and then when the people are bit by these poisonous snakes, if they look to the snake on the pole, they will live. Okay, strange story, but that happened. And the people were bit, look to the snake and you will live. And Jesus tells Nicodemus that. How does that, what would, you know, all the years, I, oh, I guess that's the reason I brought this in. I didn't know, this is my old fire department Bible. And I, I was looking at it right before I came in, I said, maybe I'll use it as a prop today. Uh, I was going to use it for another reason, but I'll, maybe this is why. For many years at the firehouse, I would, during lunch, I only ate once a day for many, many years now, I don't know, 25 years, but during lunchtime, that was a good hour and a half of me to read. And so all the guys would know that during lunch, they'd eat, you know, and I wouldn't eat. And I'd be sitting outside by the ambulance or by the fire truck, sort of like by a door, and I'd be able to read and do my study. And on that ambulance, there's an image. And the image is a snake on a pole, okay? And that historically became the image of healing. 
and even in the medical field. It, that story comes from the one I just told you, okay? Because they knew that that was an image of healing. And what does it represent? We already quoted the scriptures that Jesus went to the cross and died for the sins of men. And Jesus was sinless. He never sinned. But it was his obedience to go to the cross. And on the cross, the Bible says, he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Okay? It was that act that allowed us to become righteous in the eyes of God. Right? Not so much all the obedient acts that are given to our account, right? I don't want to debate the whole reform debate. But it was that act of obedience in the cross that we are indeed made the righteous of God in him. The snake is a type of something that is cursed, a symbol of something cursed. And we know from the account of the fallen man in the garden that the serpent, the snake, was a cursed thing. So the snake on the pole is an image of Jesus because he was on the cross bearing the curse, the sins of man, all right, on our behalf. The few verses I didn't get to quote out of the Corinthians one, it says, after the resurrection, then the final enemy will be defeated, which is death. O death, where is thy victory? O grave, where is uh, thy sting? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. That's now, when you read that, that's, those were actually in the portions of the end of the Corinthians 15 chapter. The strength of sin is the law, and some miss. How is the strength of sin the law? Go back to Romans and Paul's writing. Romans chapter 7, all right? Paul will say, because he was a religious Pharisee just like Nicodemus was, and Paul would say that the law, and this is consistent in the theology of Paul in Romans and Galatians, okay? Paul would basically say that what the law did, the law, the holy law of God, all right? The commandments and the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, the law was good and righteous and holy. But man is sinful and wicked. And so when the law is presented to men, when we understand the whole history of the Old Covenant and God giving the Ten Commandments to man, but then the history was they would always flunk, fail, and fall. They could not keep it, and over and over through the prophets. And so Paul, when he's teaching the doctrine of justification by faith, Galatians and Romans. He brings this whole thing up. He says, you're not saved by the law. No man, if there was a law given that could have made men righteous, then Paul says, verily righteousness would have been by the law. But it's not by the law because the law cannot make men holy. All right? He goes, he teaches the whole example of Abraham. Uh, how was Abraham our father when he was justified by faith, the ones I quoted? Was it after he was circumcised, which is the rite of the covenant of circumcision, which has brought you into the old covenant law? He said, no, before he was circumcised. He says, therefore, God makes people righteous before the law or without the law, because the law can't make you righteous. Now, in that context of Romans and Galatians, did a whole study on those, he says the strength of sin is the law. And in Romans 7, Paul will basically say, as this religious leader, as a Pharisee, and he even gives his history in the New Testament, he says, I excelled more than all of the others. I was more trying to be righteous than all of them. And when the law came, sin revived and I died. My son-in-law is pulling up, so I'm going to close it anyway. Paul basically said he realized his efforts at self-righteousness were ineffective. And that the law, that's where he made that quote in 1 Corinthians 15. I had to define it somewhat. He says, the strength of sin is the law. He said, when you tell a young kid, don't touch the stove, the first thing they're going to think about, I've got to touch the stove. And he said, so the purpose of the law was simply to reveal sin to sinful men. That they, that Paul says in Galatians, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And the schoolmaster was the one who took the kids the, to, to the school, to the place of truth, and then would leave them there. So the law brought all of us 
up to the point of Christ, and then we receive Christ and we believe. All right. So I think. I, oh, I didn't get to do Luke. I might. I might walk outside and finish it. Okay. You want to help with Anthony? Yeah. Okay. My son-in-law just pulled up. Uh, let me do. I'm going to walk and finish. Bethany, that's being your. Yeah. That's your last thing. Any, any questions you want to ask? Not that I can think of. Okay, no. I'm going to finish out. I told her earlier, I'm going to start now, and if Anthony, my small pulls up, I'm going to finish out. But let me just cover, it's not going to be a whole lot of news, but it'll be a little bit of the uh, passage I did not get to yet. It would be Luke 6, 39 through 45, and I figure let me hit on it, because it's part of the mass readings for this day. It, it's... It's a common uh, passage. I think most of us would be familiar with it. Can the blind lead the blind? If the blind lead the blind, they're both going to fall into a ditch. Most of us are familiar with that, all right? And we often apply it to different other churches or other religious groups or so forth. And in the context of where we're at as a people, meaning our world today, people that are living not only in Russia or the United States. Or... There are many debates that go on. And some of the debates, not just at this time, but they certainly are going on at this time. And they range around political views, ideologies. And some say... Uh, many of the scriptures, some that I think I talked about today, would talk about us as uh, caretakers of the earth, the environment, and God put it in our hands. And then you have Christian debates on these things. You have political debates. But some would say, and it is rightfully true, that we're, uh, we're supposed to care for the planet. Okay? It, it's something that's given to the dominion of man in the Genesis account, by the way have dominion of all the fish of the sea and all, and that doesn't mean you rake the environment and, you know, it means you care for it. Now some, with that view, would also say, that some hold to a more extreme view, that in a period of time, if we don't do something about whether it's global warming or other things, that it's going to kill everybody. Now most people don't hold that view, but some hold it. That in so many years, you know, everybody will be dead. Now, I'm not mocking that view. I don't agree with it to that extreme. But I'm not mocking it. But what I want you to see something, in regardless of the political side of the aisle, a person's on. That view, you could say, is based in a true, for the most part, honest concern for fellow man. Meaning, it would be a terrible thing if indeed man destroyed his environment, atmosphere, in such a way that everybody died. And so why is that a noble view? Well, because you don't want to see everybody die, or anybody. Or the whole debate on immigration. Once again, it's based on we want to treat our fellow man properly and in a right way, because he's a human. A lot of these views are based on what? the value of life. Okay, now that's a standpoint that's a good standpoint. We value life. Now, a lot of people who hold to some of the views I just talked about, and I'm not saying I don't hold to them, all right? I'm just trying to give an example here. Then at the current time in our country, you've also had a debate among many who say we want to value life also hold to a view that even after a child is born in a late-term abortion, a botched abortion, to allow that child to sit there and die, which some have referred to as infanticide. Now, to be fair to both sides of the aisle, they're not saying that once the child might be born out of a botched abortion late-term, which has happened a lot, they're advocating to just leave it. And some who are saying just leave it and let it die. You've got to understand that some of those procedures, it's gruesome. 
because you have a limb that was removed in the attempt to abort the child and it comes out and there's an arm missing, screaming. And some advocate, keep it comfortable while it dies. That those are the words of some. Now, we wouldn't treat an animal like that. And all I would say is, but the same people who are supporting that view are the ones that also support the other views. And so the question would be, when we say blind leading the blind, I'm not just speaking to one side of the aisle here. I'm saying, what are you founding your arguments on? If the foundation of your arguments of all the things is we value life, we value other human beings, that certainly is a good value. But if, you're, if it's the blind leading the blind, if you will, and you don't really know what your value, what your moral compass is, then you could not see what a contradiction that is. And I don't say it to make fun of you or to whoever. I see it that all of us, in some way, in the whole debates that are going on, I'll end it with that one example. If you went down in the uh, Luke chapter, uh, Jesus said, a bad tree cannot bring forth good fruit, a good tree cannot bring forth bad fruit, and out of the abundance of heart, the mouth speaking. But I would say on the blind leading the blind, which is something I want to hit on, it deals with just the fundamental core of how are we making these decisions. If you go all the way back to the philosophers and to the thinkers, that was a big thing. And some thinkers began saying, wait a minute. If people are just living and society is moving forward and people are doing it based out of their religious beliefs, okay, and then you'd finally have uh, Nietzsche say, maybe the problem is we shouldn't really value the weaker. A lot of these thoughts came, uh, arose even, had great influence with Adolf Hitler. And, and we, as a society today, say, how could people have been convinced that the Holocaust, as it was progressing, the extermination of a race of people, was a good thing? Some were convinced. Of course, historically, we didn't all know what was going on until after the war. But a lot of people don't realize that really Hitler was influenced a lot by Nietzsche. A lot of teachers today will try to discount that, but no, uh, he was influenced a lot. By, and now Nietzsche, to be fair in this sense, he just, at one point in his thinking, the philosopher, he began to say, why should we really value the weaker, you see? Where are you getting that from? Why should we care about whether the weaker in society should be cared for? Where's that value coming from? You see, the critics, the thinkers, and the atheists began saying, that's just some thing that the church or Christianity imposed upon you to hold back the strong of the uberman, you see, the superman. And, but it gets to the heart of where you, if there is no God to some, and yet you're trying to say, we're fighting whatever political, whatever fight it is, because it's the right thing to do. My question is, where are you defining right? If it's right to, to save the environment, which it is certainly right to save it. And if the, and the argument you make is because of our fellow man, because it would be a terrible thing if we destroyed the environment and everybody on the planet died. I don't believe that's going to happen, but... Okay, at the same time, but it's right to leave the child that was born in the corner and keep it comfortable when it's got an arm or a leg or... Okay, so you, the foundations are crumbling in that thought system. And that was the one thing that came to my mind as I was reviewing the Luke chapter, all right? If the blind... If regardless, I'm not just making a critique of one side of the aisle here, but if you don't know what you're founded upon... At the end, you both fall into the ditch. And I, I don't say this is because you very, very rarely in our country now, we're consumed. I, I wrote a little note on today's text post 
I said 90% of the corporate media, money media, are consumed with things that are ridiculous. But they're real things. And really, it's going to be the job of the church, and it is the job of the church, to speak out in defense of the poor, to, speak, uh, to not agree with the philosophy of Nietzsche, that, look, we've got to just do what we've got to do to advance. No, no, it's not that way. The ideals of Christ himself, the teachings out of Luke, that, that's where we found this on, okay? That this is, this is the basis where we're going to get this. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and mind. And to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I went long today because I didn't speak in a week, which was fine. And because uh, I've been busy doing some other things. I want to bless everybody in every place that gets to watch these videos and gets to do these things. And there will come a time when I'm doing my New York visits and New Jersey things. And when that time, when I'm up there, you're not going to see all that. Some of you are maybe, oh, yes, I'm grateful, you know, not going to post so much. So, but I want to encourage people. Uh, if you're learning, uh, people that read maybe a bunch of those whole things, the philosophy things, I reposted something on Western intellectual tradition on one of the new sites, and it was like, oh, 800 views or something right after I posted. Okay, good, I'm grateful. But don't forget, you can... If you're learning, share that stuff. That's the idea. We're not... Uh, I try to be as disconnected. I, they talk about uh, screen time. I try to limit screen time. When I'm doing the teaching and all, that's it. I'm done. I don't mean to offend people. Every now and then, meaning I'm not interacting, I don't answer messages ever on any of social media. And to be real honest, I don't have time. You know, sometimes when I turn on one of the laptops, there'll be a notification from Google, from YouTube. Somebody commented on YouTube. Somebody, I don't even read them. I, I, I mentioned this a few months ago. I have an email or a Facebook message from the producer of The Daily Show. Now, I've, I still haven't even deleted that, and I never fully read it. And I forget his name, Nathan something. Hi, John, from that, because The Daily Show was in Corpus Christi. They were doing something a few months back, and they wanted to talk to me. And it was on criminal justice reform. And I'll be real honest, I didn't even have, I didn't read the full message. But I, maybe they want to do an interview because I, I deal with social justice issues. But it's still there because when I went to Facebook, I didn't even delete the message. I didn't have time to really go through a lot of that. And so if I don't answer people on these things, it's not because I'm, it's, I'm trying to maximize the resources and the time. And so when I'm on, right now you hear me speak, I'll upload this a little later. And then tonight, my normal routine is post a bunch of videos. And that's it. I'm on for that one hour. I maximize getting to eat it and all those videos, and it's done, okay? But I love everybody, and I want to bless all you guys. And then ask, I don't ask for money or anything like that. Just whatever you're benefiting from, share those things with your friends, my new Russian friends, uh, the VK people and all. If you, it, The movement, we're part of the Christian movement. And if you're a Russian Orthodox, I do a lot of church history, or if you're a Roman Catholic, or if you're Protestant, or, look, this is a community of believers, including a lot of these, all right, Reformed, I talked about that today. So I want you to be welcome at our table. I'm not here to dissuade. I'm liberal in a lot of ways. I'm conservative in ways. I'm not here to just prove a certain side, but that we would all come. And even the non-Christian friends, I had some Muslim uh, readers, hopefully we still do. I want you all to be able to learn and to, and to be in this conversation, all right? So let me add this. Father, I thank you for all of our friends. I pray a blessing on everyone that as the teaching goes out today and in the future, that uh, people would be blessed. We ask that in Jesus' name, amen.